the lost cause. Queen Elizabeth had imposed her settlement on the Church of England in 1559. By this series of measures she aimed to force the Church into the mould of her own choosing, which was a uniform religion in all her realm. Yet although she was determined to have uniformity, what she actually obtained was anything but. The settlement satisfied only a minority of the people, the Anglicans, who were very content with the middle-of-the-road system, which was neither Romish nor Reformed. The Anglicans were also happy with Elizabeth as the supreme governor of the church, and with the act of uniformity, inasmuch as they, along with the queen, wanted all church vestments, ornaments, and traditions to be identical throughout the land and they were avid supporters of her determination to ensure that every citizen conformed to the Book of Common Prayer, right down to its smallest details. But the Anglicans were in a minority. The vast majority of the people gave only a grudging conformity to the Anglican service, and no wonder they were unregenerate, for a start. How could they form many spiritual judgment? In spite of that, because the law demanded various superstitious observances of them, and if their lives would be made difficult if they kicked off a fuss, well, then they were prepared to perform the required motions, kneel at the proper places, and chant the appropriate responses. They could always sleep during the reading of the homily, or let the pious words of the flowery sermon float above their heads, if there was any sermon to listen to, that is. The church would take care of their baptism at birth, marry them, give them the Lord's Supper, and in due course bury them. There was no need for them to bother their heads with the details. The priests would see to that. Leave it to him. In their minds it was probably all mumbo-jumbo in any case. At every step the church would assure them that they were certain to inherit everlasting life, no questions asked. No doubt an unthinking conformity to meaningless ritual was, for many people, a small price to pay for such a blanket assurance. On the other hand, there were those who did think very seriously about these matters. They had very strong convictions about the Queen's idea of a church. They were convinced the state church was a disgrace, and consequently they set themselves resolutely against the settlement. That does not mean they agreed among themselves, of course. The Papists, the Puritans, the Anabaptists, in addition to some others who separated from the state church to worship in secret, clashed with each other. But one thing they did have in common. They were all hostile to the Elizabethan settlement, whatever else they did not agree on. For these reasons, the Church of England in the early 1560s was totally muddled, lumbering along in its deep-seated confusion. But it managed to struggle on, partly because at first the act of uniformity was not as rigidly enforced as it might have been. The chaos and disorder was regarded with a certain amount of tolerance by the Queen, but not for long. Leaving aside for the moment those believers who separated themselves from the established church to worship with the Anabaptists, or to join one of the various secret churches, the main objectors to the prayer book service were the Puritans from within the pale of the church. They took up spiritual arms against the settlement and resisted the queen, demanding reform. But Elizabeth and her supporters fought back and fought back hard. Battle was joined in earnest. Even so, it proved an unequal contest, and from the Puritan point of view, it was a losing battle. The climax came quickly in 1563 at the convocation which marked the last real stand of the Puritans within the Church of England. From that time on, they were on a generally downward course. They would have minor successes within the Church, winning lesser skirmishes, but they would never get the upper hand, apart from a short period eighty years later. The Puritans presented a formal statement of their grievances and submitted a petition for reform at the said 1563 Convocation. They objected to the surplus, and wanted the Genevan gown instead, calling the odious surplus a relic of Romanism. They also asked for the abolition of all the offensive vestments, and an end to noxious ceremonies, such as kneeling at the supper, observance of saints' days, and the sign of the cross in baptism. After the debate came the vote. It was a close-run thing, but the Puritans lost by one. 
they got 58 votes, the Anglicans 59. It was a bitter blow to the Puritans, who never recovered from this narrowest of defeats. What is more, the cracks already apparent in the Puritan ranks now became wider and positions hardened, so that three distinct parties developed within the Puritan movement itself. First, there were those Puritans who were now prepared to continue to conform despite their beliefs. They had raised their objections and made their protest. These had been turned down in blunt terms. So, what did they do about it? They gave in and compromised themselves. They made the best of a bad job. But were they right? Were they right to remain within the Church of England? How could any Puritan justify remaining in such an adulterated church? Was it a church at all? How could the conforming Puritans try to worship under the conditions imposed by the prayer book? In what ways did they square the glaring inconsistency between their scriptural convictions and the corrupt practices of their church? How could they reconcile the Church of England with the New Testament? The truth is they could not. They knew the state church was defective. They openly said as much. They wanted its many abuses abolished, but convocation refused. Therefore they yielded, observing the offensive rigmarole, as by law established. In short, they knowingly compromised. So why did these Puritans accept the act of uniformity and go along with the Elizabethan settlement? Why did they not leave the Church of England at this point? Other Puritans did, of course. All honour to them. Even some bishops refused to conform, and were deprived of their livings for their pains. But the majority of Puritans remained within the church. They grumbled, but they stayed. To be fair to them, the whole notion of leaving the church was still a revolutionary idea at that time. There was only one church in England which the state recognised. Twelve hundred years of patristic, Romish, Constantine thought patterns of a universal state church, one church outside of which there was no church, perhaps no salvation even, dominated men's minds. To try to worship God outside the state church automatically made men into heretics, and the authorities exacted severe penalties upon them. Only those wretched Anabaptists and their ilk dared that kind of nonconformity, and were they not the scum of the earth? Besides, look what happened to them. Think about the treatment they received. Get out of the Church of England? Not likely. Religious observance was strictly regulated and enforced by the inflexible law of the land, and the novel idea of quitting the national church was just unthinkable for the overwhelming majority of the people. It wouldn't be decent. Why, nearly two centuries later, the Anglican John Wesley could hardly bring himself to preach the gospel in the fields. It was so novel, it was hardly respectable. It must be sinful. And, as an attempted justification of their action or inaction, the conforming Puritans could always fall back on the argument of staying in it to win it. They were willing to go along with the system, bide their time, and, they hoped, reform the church. To be fair to many of them, they honestly thought that they could influence others and thus bring about their desired aims. They wanted to be useful. However, it has to be said that if that was the Puritan's intention, to stay in to influence the other sections of the Church of England, and by this means get reform, then they failed miserably. In reality, the influence acted the other way. But in any case, his argument misses the point. God has told us in plain words how we must sort out these matters. In a rhetorical question, he asked, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. God demands obedience above all else. This principle is so important, it is repeated several times in scriptures. The priority for the conforming Puritans should have not been to exercise influence over the other members of the Church of England. Their duty was to obey God's word, as it is for all Christians today. 
The first responsibility was not to try to influence the corrupt state church by staying in it and compromising themselves with its corruptions. Their duty was to worship God according to his truth, his revealed word. It is the same for us. This is what God demands. It is what he seeks. Jesus said, True worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. In any case, in addition to pleasing God, it is likely that they would have had far more influence for good within the Church of England if they had left it. How, however oddly that may read, it is so. After all, a would-be rescuer does no good at all, not for himself, nor for the one to be rescued, if he jumps into a bog to help the one already trapped in the mire. The illustration is somewhat inadequate, of course. In this instance, both men were in the bog to start with. But if one could have got out, he ought to have done so. He certainly would have had more chance to rescue the other. In it to win it. Who gave them the right to say such a thing? They knew the system they were involved in was popish, even pagan. They said it was, and said it repeatedly. They abhorred its superstitions and corruptions. They knew that the ungodly were forced to be members of the church. It was a wicked shambles. The Puritans had demanded reform, and it had been flatly rejected. Well then, what should they have done about it? They should have obeyed God's word, not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. How often the compromising argument has been used down the centuries. It is trotted out to this very day. Perhaps you are using it yourself. If so, you must understand that Scripture roundly condemns such an attitude. Not surprisingly, the Puritan recourse to it failed. It failed miserably. Frankly, it was a disaster in the 16th and 17th centuries. It always is. In spite of that, many Puritans could not be persuaded to give up their vain hope until even they, at last, saw the futility of it in 1662, when the vast majority of the then conforming Puritans finally abandoned the Church of England as hopelessly beyond reform. Even then, a few still did not quit. William Gurnall of Lavenham in Suffolk, for one, remained and continued to conform to its service. Secondly, to complicate matters, there were other Puritans who formed another group. They compromised even more than the above mentioned. In short, they practically gave up all fight for reform, capitulated, and virtually went over to the Anglicans. To be realistic, it would hardly be fair to call them Puritans from this time on. It is especially sad to record that some, perhaps many, of the Marian exiles belonged to this group, particularly those who accepted high office under Elizabeth. More on this a little later. Thirdly, in sharp contrast to the last mentioned, there were some Puritans who went the other way, being forged out of better material. They could not compromise themselves, they would not conform, and therefore they were ejected from the Church of England. Thus, former Puritan friends were divided after 1563. This should cause no surprise, seeing Christ gave clear warnings that this would happen. He said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. If families are divided by Christ and his demands in the gospel, it is no wonder the Puritans were, and their divisions, once apparent, became sharper and more clearly defined as time went on. Elizabeth had thrown her enemies into total disarray. She, clever politician that she was, had worked the old trick, divide and conquer. Some of the Puritans, who did not capitulate altogether, but nevertheless remained within the state church, now took the view that since all constitutional methods for reform had been exhausted, they must use their wits to do what they could to get the church nearer to the New Testament pattern. 
while going along with the corruptions of the church. They tried to think of ways to leaven it for its good, to bring about a gradual weakening of the Anglican position, and to arouse a desire within the people for spiritual worship. They adopted means designed to give the Church of England members a taste of good preaching, in the hope they would demand it of the authorities, and get it, of course. Thus the conforming Puritans swallowed the compromise, yet at the same time they sought to obey conscience, submit to Scripture, and do all within their power to establish a purer form of worship within the Church of England, even though this was against the law of the land. This battle between Elizabeth and her bishops on the one hand, and these determined Puritans on the other, was bitter. Sad to record, in this fight the Queen was much helped by the one-time Puritans whom she had bought off, principally Archbishop Parker, one of those who had now retreated from his earlier Puritan position, tried to force his old friends to conform, even on his own initiative and without waiting for the Queen. Far from contenting himself with meekly enforcing Elizabeth's edicts, he set about the Puritans with a will, and on his own authority. He introduced the Book of Advertisements in 1566, which established a minimum uniformity in vestments, the compulsory use of the homilies, and a set posture to be adopted in worship. The surplus had to be worn, he declared, with copes and hoods as well on certain special occasions. Preachers were not allowed to compose their own sermons, but were forced to make do with Cranmer's homilies. Kneeling was compulsory at the Lord's Supper. Uniformity was the watchword. It was a criminal offence not to use the prayer book in every particular. Not to take the oath of supremacy was high treason. No wonder the origin of the name Nosy Parker is attributed to this man. Of him it has been said, a hot-headed, intolerant, arbitrary, and vindictive man, he was the model of an Elizabethan archbishop. So zealously did he set about his work that he shocked the statesmen of his age, and at last shocked even Elizabeth herself. Another Puritan who went back was Jewell. He had given the game away when he published his apology in 1562. In it he wrote, This is our doctrine that every soul, what calling soever he be, be he monk, be he preacher, be he prophet, be he apostle, is to be subject to kings and magistrates. The writing was on the wall. Seemingly Jewel, the former Puritan, would obey his queen, even though she commanded him to disobey Christ. Commendably at this point, the resolute Puritans dug their heels in and stoutly refused. Indeed, there is evidence that some of them were being influenced by the Anabaptists at this time. But refusal to conform meant ejection, with consequent poverty and many other miseries. Standing for Christ would inevitably bring them to the life of distress the Anabaptists had long endured. In particular, Parker and Grindle were determined to force the clergy of the City of London to subscribe. Even so, 37 out of 110 refused, and were ejected. Bishop Cox, another Marian exile and one-time supporter of Puritan aims, also now stoutly resisted the cause for reform. Having been severe towards papists in the past, he now turned on his former allies. He went as far as to recognize the Anabaptist influence over some of them, complaining of the Puritans that many obstinately refused to enter our churches, either to baptize their children, or to partake of the Lord's Supper, or to hear sermons. They are entirely separated from us. They seek bypaths, they establish a private religion, and assemble in private houses, and there perform their sacred rites as the Anabaptists. The determined Puritans fought back against their erstwhile supporters, using all the means at their disposal. Those prevented from preaching attacked the establishment in pamphlets. This restless, critical, and sometimes rebellious group of Puritans continued to be thoroughly dissatisfied. The Reformation in England was only half-hearted. It had brought the church out from Rome, but had stopped short of Geneva or Zurich, that is, short of Scripture as they saw it. They pushed for their long-held convictions, 
They wanted purity of worship and discipline within the state church, the reformation of the ceremonies and other similar changes. They wanted good preachers. They objected to the waste of money on cathedrals. They rejected the superstitions such as the service for the churching of women, the sign of the cross in baptism, the use of the wedding ring, kneeling at the Lord's Supper and all the rest of it. They made trenchant use of the familiar arguments when they condemned the ministerial garments as rags of Antichrist, the gear of the apostate church. To wear them, they knew, was but the first step in a return to wholesale popery. One said, If we are bound to wear popish apparel when commanded, we may be obliged to have shaven crowns and to use oil and cream and spittle with all the rest of the papistical additions to the ordinances of Christ. In light of this rebellion, the Queen was advised to stand firm. She needed no encouragement to resist but she certainly received it. Her advisers knew her weak spot. They told her that if the Puritans got their way, and if the concern of religion came into popular hands, there would be a power set up distinct from yours, over which you could have no authority. Elizabeth was easily convinced of this. She would tolerate no other authority than her own. There could be no rival. Therefore she declared that to allow churches with contrary rules and ceremonies were nothing else but to sow discord, to distract men's minds, to cherish factious men's humours, to disturb religion and commonwealth, and mingle divine and human things, which were a thing indeed evil, to our own subjects hurtful, nor yet at all safe. According to this claptrap, Apparently the souls of men are safer, better provided for by the likes of Queen Elizabeth and her all-embracing church under compulsion than by the Holy Spirit in churches established according to the pattern of the New Testament. The bishops were another tremendous hindrance to Puritan demands for reform, since they possessed power both at court and in the House of Lords. One Puritan sympathizer grieved that the bishops reign as sole monarchs in the midst of ignorant and weak men and easily overreach our little party. Very serious consequences came from this bitter attack upon the Puritans. The ejection of faithful ministers, combined with the Anglican policy of pluralism and non-residency, absentee ministers who received stipends for more than one living, even though they did no work for the money brought spiritual destitution to many parts of the country. The people of Cornwall justly complained that the churches are supplied by men who are guilty of the grossest sins, some fornicators, some adulterers, some felons, some drunkards, gamesters, scarcely any of whom could preach a sermon, and most of whom were pluralists and non-residents. In 1567, some distressed inhabitants of Suffolk pleaded with Archbishop Barker that their teaching minister might be restored to his pulpit because, as they said, there is not one preacher within twenty miles. In those days, as a direct result of Elizabeth's policy, only one in five parish churches had a minister of any sort, many of whom could not preach. In spite of this, former Puritan sympathizers now in high office and holding the reins of power, continued to eject able ministers from the Church of England just because they would not use the prescribed vestments. The authorities preferred a fool, a drunkard, an adulterer, and an unregenerate babbler in the pulpit rather than a gospel minister, as long as that fool was dressed in popish garb. The outcome was that zealous and learned preachers were suspended there was no preaching in vacant places. In some cases, the persons appointed to succeed them had neither good learning nor good name, but were drunkards and of filthy life, notoriously unfit, some for lack of learning and others charged with enormous crimes as drunkenness, filthiness of life, gaming at cards and haunting of alehouses. In the Diocese of Bangor, it was usual for the clergy some years after Elizabeth's accession to pay the bishop for a license to keep a concubine. 
With the clergy in such a decadent spiritual state, it is not surprising that the majority of the members of the Church of England, that profane multitude, should be no better. The dire condition of the state church can be judged by the need for Grindle to issue a decree that no peddler be admitted to sell his wares in the church porch in divine service, that parish clerks shall be able to read, that no disguised persons or morris dancers shall come irreverently into the church or play any unseemly parts with scoffs, jests, wanton gestures or ribald talk in the time of divine service. No doubt the profane and unregenerate multitude who were compelled to attend the Anglican service actually preferred the peddler to the preacher, the Morris dancer to the minister of the gospel. The natural man would surely find plenty of pleasure or fun in listening to and repeating the mistakes of a parish clerk who could not read, far more fun than in hearing the clear discourses of a faithful preacher of Christ, one who would convict him of his sin. The Puritan ministers, who were silenced and ejected, because they would not compromise, were exposed to grievous sufferings and hardships. Thrown out of the Church of England, they swelled the ranks of the other despised saints, the Anabaptists and similar riffraff. Their common plight was desperate. Shortage of money and want of clothes brought inevitable disease, many coming to a premature old age in poverty, want and shame. Indeed, many went down to their graves in sorrow. In harsh contrast to that grim existence, power, wealth, and ease associated with an elevated position began to influence the men who, though they had once been fired with enthusiasm for reform, succumbed to Elizabeth's patronage and accepted high office. Their delight, the life and order they had once found in the reformed churches on the continent, became but a dim memory, which they pushed to the back of the mind. Elizabeth fawned on them, flattered them, bought them. They were no longer persecuted as in Mary's reign. Like a bad dream, those days had long gone for the compromisers, who grew fat and kicked, as they accumulated wealth and privilege. Archbishop Parker, for instance, exhibited almost regal magnificence. It was reported of Whitgift, later to be Archbishop, that he surpassed even Parker. He travelled with a retinue of one hundred servants, including forty gentlemen with chains of gold. He kept a fair stable of horses, with sufficient weapons and men to the end that he was able at all times to furnish a small army for his own use. In it, to win it, those one-time Puritans who took that line and compromised, and especially those who accepted office, did not influence the corrupt Church of England. The Church influenced many of them, and how. It made some of them very rich and powerful. And what of the cause of Christ and his scorned servants, meanwhile? Well might they have said with Paul and with the same tone, we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Even to the present hour we both hunger and thirst. And we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure it. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things, until now. It did not all go the Anglican's way, however. The Puritan cause was somewhat advanced by the political intrigues of the papers. The obnoxious Jesuits infiltrated the country and stirred up strife. The Pope excommunicated Elizabeth in 1570. The Papists massacred the Huguenots in Paris on Black Bartholomew in 1572, and there were many acts of treachery by Romish priests in England, all of which gave rise to a nationwide revulsion against the papacy. At times it even looked as though the Puritans might actually come to control the Church of England, but on each occasion Elizabeth responded vigorously, silenced many more Puritans, brought them to court, and had them treated as rebels, traitors, and fools. The Queen declared that the Puritans 
were greater enemies to her than the papists. She certainly backed her words with actions. Positions became even more hardened. It was bound to happen. The Puritan objections to the Elizabethan settlement in the early 1560s had been on the grounds of vestments, but as time went on, the number of disputed issues increased. For one thing, the Puritans were appalled at the disastrous consequences of enforcing the homilies on the people instead of allowing real sermons to be preached by real preachers. They knew that Scripture emphasizes preaching above the Lord's Supper. They resented the liturgy and criticized the insistence on set forms of prayer. Some of them even set up a shadow church which was ready to seize power in the Church of England given the opportunity. Naturally, this shadow Puritan church, although it had some similarities with the Anglican church, had marked differences too. The central part of Puritan worship was the sermon in which the Puritans were sure that God declares his word of salvation by the exposition of Scripture and his application to all the hearers. No red homily could possibly satisfy their demand for such a living spiritual ministry. Ministers who read the official homilies were nothing better than dumb dogs. In addition to their stand on preaching, the Puritans began to question the whole matter of authority in the church. Who is its head and ruler? Where does the power and governance of the church lie? In this way, the great issue in the struggle to recover New Testament church life began to centre on the question of authority. What is the rule by which church matters are to be determined? The Anglicans and the Puritans took diametrically opposite views on this vital issue. It was the question thrashed out between Hooper and Ridley twenty years before. It is of perennial duration. Fundamentally, the Anglicans argued that the Church should decide matters. The Puritans asserted that Scripture should decide. The Anabaptists had long maintained such a view. The Puritans were catching up. The typical Puritan viewpoint was that of William Ames, who wrote in a later generation that the Scriptures do pertain to the instructing of all the faithful through all ages, as if they had been specially directed to them. The scripture is not partial, but a perfect rule of faith and manners. Neither is there here anything that is constantly and everywhere to be observed in the church of God, which is not contained in the scriptures. The Anglicans opposed this view with vigor. Their most able exponent was Richard Hooker, who first set out the principles which still govern the Anglican system. He claimed that there is no single definite form of church government revealed in Scripture, that Scripture alone is not sufficient for guidance in the church, that there are many apostolic customs and rites which are not recorded in Scripture, that many of God's laws can be changed, that reason as much as Scripture must determine the right course in the church as in everyday life, that man's authority has great weight, that things recorded in Scripture are not necessarily to be regarded as commands, that to rely upon Scripture alone would be a very uncertain thing. All this was a direct contradiction of the Puritans, who appealed only to Scripture. Their opponents appealed to the Fathers. The Puritans wanted only the practices warranted by Scripture, and they wanted all of them in their churches. Their opponents liked the inventions of men. The Puritans were convinced that Christ had not been niggardly, only giving his church some instruction on some church matters, not even much instruction on the subject. No, Christ has given full instruction as to every aspect of church life. Everything the church needs is in Scripture. The Puritans were in the right in this debate. One of the purposes of the Scriptures is that the godly might know how to conduct themselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. They give us a pattern of sound words, which Christians must hold fast. The apostolic teachings are the last word, since Christ promised that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth was fulfilled. He will teach you all things, was the promise of Christ to them, and so he did. It is the duty of believers to obey the apostolic commands given in Scripture. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. That is, Hold to the apostolic council. As Paul said, keep the traditions as I delivered them to you. 
the apostolic commendation is what the saints must seek after. We know what that commendation is, and we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. And again, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life. All this is based on the certainty that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is the responsibility of the church to preach the word, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Exactly so. The Puritans found that Hooker led the Church of England into that very condition. Nor is it unknown in our generation, in other churches besides the state church. The Anglicans took the view that Christ has to be helped out by the wisdom of men in the ordering of the church. The Puritans naturally allowed that there are circumstances common to human actions and societies, some matters which have to be decided in the light of common sense and circumstances, the actual hour at which to hold a service, for instance. But the final authority in all matters, including church life for them, was Scripture. And this authority extended to all church life, to each and every aspect of it, including discipline. The Puritans aimed to get as close as possible to New Testament simplicity and spirituality in worship. They deplored the riot of motley inventions and corruptions which the Anglican system produced. The Puritan emphasis upon precise obedience to Scripture coupled with discipline in the Church earned them other nicknames, such as disciplinarians or precisions. When one Puritan was told that he was too precise, he retorted, Sir, I serve a precise God. How did the determined Puritans go about the task of securing this pure scriptural worship of God within the Church of England? They realized that they could not get Elizabeth to change her mind, so they thought their aims would best be served by improving the quality of preaching, having dismissed the reading of the homilies as totally insufficient. To this end of improving preaching, they set up what they called prophesyings, meetings at which a number of preachers would gather, each man being given the same text to expand with the younger, less experienced preachers going first. For instance, at the Northampton prophesyings, the first preacher was given 45 minutes, the others 15 minutes each so that they could correct any mistakes and improve the discourse. Each preacher began and ended with prayer. Discussion and criticism followed. The text of the next meeting would be announced at the close. But Elizabeth objected to this Puritan emphasis upon preaching, and she fought the battle against them with consummate skill. When Parker died in 1575, she appointed Grindle as Archbishop. He had become Bishop of London in 1559, was elevated to York in 1570, and was now enthroned at Canterbury. He, of course, had been in exile during Mary's reign and was in his heart a Puritan sympathiser, even though he had acted contrary to his convictions. This promotion for Grindle was an astute move on Elizabeth's part, and she was clever enough not to press him to enforce strict conformity on the Puritans for a little while. But it was not long before she told him that he must put a stop to the prophesyings. He resisted bravely, even rebuking the Queen, for his spirit was even now with the Puritans. He told her frankly that she was not competent to interfere in such matters. He wrote to her to remind her of some home truths about preaching, declaring, Nothing is more evident from Scripture than it is a great blessing to have the gospel preached and to have plenty of labourers sent into the Lord's harvest. Reading of homilies is good, yet it is not comparable to preaching, which might be suited to the hearers, and be delivered with more efficacy and affection. The homilies were devised only to supply the want of preachers, and were to give place to sermons whenever they might be had. I hope your majesty will not discountenance an ordinance so useful, and of divine appointment." Elizabeth responded in a decisive manner. 
she would not let an archbishop tell her what she could or could not do. She isolated Grindel and degraded him for his insolence, virtually depriving him of office, and the prophesyings were duly stopped. Grindel died a few years later, physically blind and cutting a pathetic figure. The Puritans took other steps to improve preaching, appointing what they called lecturers, men who were free of all pastoral responsibility and who simply preached the truth at stated times, usually in market towns. They did not lecture in the sense of the word today. They preached. Despite this strategy, they could not make up the loss sustained by poor church life. Preaching in itself is not sufficient on its own. However good it is, it will never replace the whole range of spiritual life within the church. At this point, I merely draw attention to the tendency to divorce preaching from church life. I shall return to it. The Puritans did all they could to think of to recover the New Testament emphasis upon preaching, arranging their buildings with a central pulpit. They preached very, very frequently. Some men preached daily. Their manner was to preach systematically through the Scriptures, and crowds flocked to hear them. The Puritans believed in exposition of Scripture, not exposition of doctrine, or talks on the teaching of the Church, as the Anglicans preferred. Furthermore, they had a definite aim in mind, subservient to the glory of God, believing that preaching was designed to collect the church and to accomplish the number of the elect. But the typical Anglican, Elizabeth herself above all, continued to oppose the Puritan view. The Anglicans did not really like preaching at all. For instance, neither the morning or evening service of the prayer book stipulates a sermon. Not only that, when they did preach, unlike the Puritans, the Anglicans did not start with the text of Scripture, but they started with a doctrine, a subject, or a theme, and then looked for a part of Scripture to pin it on. What is more, the Puritans always made personal and pointed application to their hearers once they had established their doctrine out of the Bible. In contrast, the Anglicans went through a kind of performance which was lifeless and powerless. They went in for displays of eloquence and flourishing orations, whereas the Puritans demanded plain, direct, experimental and soul-saving preaching. Nevertheless, despite all the efforts of the Puritans, who compromised and stayed inside the Church of England, hoping to reform it from within by forming a shadow church and all the rest of it, the protest ultimately proved to be a failure. The same applies today. The Puritans were betrayed by their ex-friends who accepted high office. The temporary accommodations and compromises of Parker, Grindle, Jewell, Cox and others hindered the purification of the church, the very purification which they themselves had once hoped for. But beyond the infighting which took place between the Puritans and the Anglicans, and among the Puritans themselves, Elizabeth towered majestically above them all. She would not allow the Puritan reforms. And that was that. Thus, at the end of the 1570s, the split between the Puritans and the Anglicans was complete. And by then it was clear that Elizabeth ruled the Church of England with an iron rod. The prayer book was virtually set in stone. The Church of England would never become a reformed church, leaving aside the temporary hiccup of the 1640s. The Puritans were defeated. However, it took some of them a very long time to admit it. But they had lost, and lost forever. The recovery of the New Testament pattern of Christ's church would come about, but it would happen outside the establishment. Many very important questions arise out of this struggle between Elizabeth and the Puritans. For example, are you bothered about your church life, and whether or not it is in accordance with Scripture? How important is this to you? If you had lived during the reign of the first Elizabeth, you would have belonged to one of the groups in England at the time, which the church was a shambles in the 1560s. In many cases, it is the same today. It may be your experience even now. If you can get no further than sighing and crying over the corruption of the church, deploring its tragic decline, this is in itself pleasing to God, Ezekiel 9 verse 4. But is there anything you can do to rectify matters in your local church? Further, how important is preaching to you? 
Does it matter very much to you? The New Testament puts it in a higher position than baptism and the Lord's Supper. Do you do the same? Again, what is preaching? How do you define it? Do you think there is much real preaching in these days? In addition, what do you expect from preaching? Do you get it? If not, why not? You know you are accountable to God. You must think of what you can do about the dearth of preaching, which is so common nowadays. Are you doing anything about it? And when you do hear preaching, how do you prepare yourself for it? And what steps do you take to ensure that you benefit by it? Or are you easily robbed of the good seed as the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in your heart? Or is the word of God choked within you by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches? As you have seen, there have been times in England when there was very little preaching of God's word, but just the reading of homilies or worse. And dreadful times they were. The godly who were forced to endure the tragic loss of preaching felt it bitterly and grieved over it. Give us back our teaching minister, they pleaded. There is not one preacher in twenty miles they mourned. What if such days should return? They well might. There is no denying the fact that today in many parts of the country it is getting very difficult, if not impossible, to hear a real gospel sermon. It is one of the sure marks of God's judgment upon a people when he removes the preaching of his word. Ahab and Israel came under the punishment of drought, but they had to endure a far greater judgment. The prophet Elijah was not allowed to preach to them. The sun beat down remorselessly. Far worse, God's silence was deafening. Will a judgment of silence from God come upon us? Error and nonsense will fill the vacuum. Myths and fables are always waiting in the wings. If the word of God is taken from us, the missal or the Koran will soon be heard in the pulpits of England. Think of that. But nothing can replace the irreplaceable. Nothing but the spiritual and lively preaching of God's word will do. Yet we cannot take it for granted that we shall always have it. Oh no, God has warned us. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. In that day the fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst. Such days may not be far off. We may soon have to use the words of the man in Psalm 74. Some of us may feel they are irrelevant already. That good man was smitten with grief when the temple was filled with pagan objects, which obscured the tokens of God's presence. He cried out, The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet nor is there any among us who knows how long. Oh, God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. Arise, O oh God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Amen to that heart-rending call.